right, hi everyone, welcome, welcome in. Thank you so much for joining today's session. Um, I'm gonna do my best to be prompt with time, so it is 11 on the dot and I will kick us off, but uh, as folks are rolling in, please come grab a seat. Uh, thank you so much for joining today's session, From Garbage to Gold, Uncovering the Value of Recycling, Composting, and Anaerobic Dige Digestion. Uh, we are joined by an incredibly talented and accomplished group of panelists today. Um, I have personally been looking forward to this conversation for quite some time, so I'm really excited that today has arrived. Over the next hour, we will be digging into the current landscape of adoption and challenges facing composting and anaerobic digestion, uh, as well as investment opportunities in the space, uh, infrastructural needs, and even perhaps dabbling in some supportive policy in this space and what that might, might look like. So before I introduce our amazing group of panelists, just some quick housekeeping notes, so bear with me. Uh, we're gonna have approximately 35 minutes for this facilitated uh, discussion amongst panelists, followed by about 15 minutes for a facilitated Q&A with you all. So please hold your questions until the end. We can't wait to hear from you. Uh, please note we are recording today's session and the uh, live stream of the session will be available on demand on Hubilo, as well as Refed's website after the event. During the Q&A portion, uh, we'll be passing around a, a handheld microphone to you all, so please make sure to use that so we can hear all of your great questions. Uh, feel free to continue the conversation via the discussion board in the app if you feel inspired and inclined to do so after today's panel. We certainly encourage that. And lastly, if you could just uh, silence or mute your phones or any other devices just to uh, prevent any distractions, we would greatly appreciate that. Thank you so much. So without further ado, let's meet today's wonderful panelists. I will start us off with Jessica Toth. Jessica is Executive Director of the Solana Center for Environmental Innovation, which serves Southern California with the vision of landfills free of edible and compostable material operationalized by Solana Center's role designing innovative solutions and consulting to food businesses. Solana Center and Jessica have received awards for environmental leadership, including most recently the U.S. Composting Council's Organics Diversion Program of the Year 2023 and the San Diego Business Journal's 50 Over 50 Women of Influence in San Diego. Jessica has held <laughs> That's right, 30 under 30 is what we meant to say. That was a typo. <laughs> Jessica has held positions in research, marketing, and process improvement at various companies, including her own software startup, and she holds degrees from Cornell in MIT in engineering and business. Nora Goldstein, directly to my left, is editor and publisher of BioCycle Connect and BioCycle.net, the Organics Recycling Authority. Nora is in her fifth decade of working at BioCycle. She received the U.S. Composting Council's High Kellogg Award for Outstanding Service to the Composting Industry and the American Biogas Council's Biogas Visionary Award. Ryan Cooper is the VP of Circular Economy Solutions at Rubicon, a platform that provides smart waste and recycling solutions for businesses and governments worldwide. Prior to designing, implementing, and managing thousands of organics recycling programs at Rubicon, Ryan helped develop composting programs for businesses and municipalities at the Sustainable Pact Coalition. Ryan received his master's of, Master of Science in Regenerative Studies at Cal Poly Pomona, where his theme focused on municipal composting and anaerobic digestion programs. Ryan is on the board of directors of the U.S. Composting Council and is a certified permaculture designer and teacher. Last but certainly, certainly not least, we have Ben Keithy. Ben is the Vice President of Consum Customer Solutions and Success at Divert Inc., an impact technology company on a mission to protect the value of food. Ben joined Divert in 2016 and has played an instrumental role in helping to build and scale Divert's business. Specifically, over the last four years, he has built out the Solutions and Success team, working with Divert's retail grocery customers to set a new standard for how wasted food is measured, mitigated, and managed. Currently serving over 5,400 retail grocery locations and counting, Divert is setting the foundation to feed more people and decarbonize the food supply chain at scale. So an impressive array of folks, to say the least. Uh, and if you're wondering who I am, really quickly, hello everyone, I am Caroline Berry. 
I am the program manager at uh, the Composting Consortium, which is managed by the Center for the Circular Economy at Closed Loop Partners. Um, Closed Loop Partners is an investment firm, an innovation center, and an operations arm. And we are a leader in the circular economy space. And the Composting Consortium specifically uh, is a collaboration made up of folks throughout the compostable packaging value chain. And we're piloting a myriad of uh, industry solutions for investment and technologies and infrastructure that enable the recovery of food scraps, um, but also the recovery of compostable food packaging. So enough about us. Without further ado, let's, let's dive into the panel here today. So we are all here at this conference because a collective challenge, which is wasted food. There's this outstanding question on what types of food should be diverted to different downstream processors if it's deemed inedible or can't be donated otherwise. Knowing that food waste is not a monolith, I'm wondering how can we match the feedstock to composting and anaerobic digestion infrastructure more thoughtfully? Perhaps a loaded question, but I might ask Nora to kick us off this morning with an answer. It's, uh, is this on? I think so. Okay. Can you all hear Nora all right? Yeah. Okay. So f food waste is a monolith um, where biocycle enters the conver. Just a little closer. A little closer. Yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> Try. Uh, where we enter the conversation is where it is no longer edible or saleable or donatable um, and has to find a pathway. And we look at it from the various sectors, uh, retail, se you know, commercial uh, food service, commercial retail, institutional, residential, industrial. So there's all these you know, categories of food waste. And the way it's generated, um, it usually requires some degree of source separation, right? We're just used to putting it right in the trash, goes to the landfill. And so when you're looking at your options for managing food waste streams, one of the things that historically has had to happen is source separation. So that usually happened at the grocery store. The intervention was in the deli, in the floral department, in the meat department, <clears throat> excuse me, required depack, you know, and re taking the lettuce out of the bag, et cetera. And um, then similarly in institutional, so pretty, um, let me just say, grocery tends to be pre-consumer, meaning it hasn't, it's not, post that hasn't gone through some con consumption phase. And then basically <clears throat> pre-consumer food waste tends to be clean. It was the low hanging fruit that went to composting um, early on. Residential typically source separated, typically goes to composting, but what, and we're gonna get into this discussion, but as there's been these mandates in the handful of states to ban disposal of commercial food waste streams, and you want to go not just after those that are source separating, but the food waste that doesn't make it to the grocery store shelves or the, the food service. So now it's in packaging. So what we have seen over the last, I don't know, I'll give it, I'll say five years, but it's probably more like 10 evolving, but really accelerated in the last five, is the advent of technology to separate that food from its packaging that yields a slurry, which is a feedstock for anaerobic digestion. So where the rubber meets the road, it is, has evolved to, is the degree of source separation. And there's the default, I think the sort of the, the lowest common denominator is just to take it all, you know, separate it generally, but put it through like some sort of mechanical processing, but what that does is it really affects, if you're looking at food waste recycling as a whole, your end markets and your ability to have a quality uh, digestate or a quality compost, because when you're going through that heavy duty mechanical separation, there is an opportunity for contamination. So that was way long winded, but I was trying to kind of paint where food waste intersection comes into the picture. No, not at all. I think it was perfect. Thank you for setting the stage for us, Nora. Thank you. Um, ben, I'll invite you to chime in and, and 
we'll open, we'll continue this question for all of our panelists, so please. Yeah, I mean, Nora hit on a lot of the major points. It's a pretty complex problem, and it's, it's also understanding how do you connect, like what are all the dots that you need to connect, and then how do you connect those when they're not all built? So I think looking at it for certain regions or markets and saying what are the different generators, like what's that first point, whether it's farms, what's generated there, grocery stores, uh, municipalities, and then what are they like? What are the interoperations there, and how do we kind of meet them to the where they're at, but also elevate? And so, you know, for Divert at least, speaking about what we've done is really focused just on the grocery industry, that pre-consumer, you know, big opportunity. We, you know, kind of we see there's a lot of the same type of material. Let's really understand how we can set the foundation. We've looked at compost animal feed and for us you know anaerobic digestion was a big part of that because there was this packaging and this packaged food waste that was still going in the landfill because where they're at in terms of operations all the things that you know a grocery store has to do how do we make it simple executable but also not have downstream consequences that we're just going to make it too easy where you know, it's like single stream recycling. You throw everything in a bin, and then you're trying to figure out on the back end. You have a you know low, low uh, quality digestate, or you have microplastics going downstream. So we've really just hyper focused on grocery to understand what types of material. How do we make it? You know, we don't we don't want to make have too many programs, but also don't want to have just one giant bin for everything because then we can't do what we're doing on the back end. And I think the key that we also say in all of this is how do we set the foundation for prevention and food recovery? How do we learn from this wasted food? And I think when we look at the packaging and the non-packaged, we can get the most insights from that to feed it back to the grocers and say, hey, here's some ways that we can kind of create this feedback loop. Anaerobic digestion, this whole downstream process and infrastructure supports that. Excellent points. Ryan, please. So I would just add that, you know, I think that um, animal feed definitely, well, obviously first prevention and donation, but after that animal feed definitely plays a, a huge role in, you know, food waste in general, but specifically, you know, the pre-consumers. So I think if you look way back in the day, you know, there was collection even at a residential le level going to animal feed, but we're here to talk about anaerobic digestion and composting and so like from a permaculture perspective you kind of want to do end and and you know can you feed it to animals first then send it to ad then send it to compost you know what what other processes can we add and i think ben mentioned the number of programs and so really a huge part of it just comes down to a the infrastructure in the area because that's going to dictate where it can go if there is a but not b but also how exactly like what Ben said, how much can you slice and dice that? How many bins can there possibly be at one site? And how confusing can you possibly make it for your associates that it's already like asking them to do this separation phase? So, um, you know, I think that that's the balance. And then the packaging piece, you know, if you are gonna go to depackaging, well, then it creates a slurry and so, you know, when we, I think it's important to mention that when we talk about AD, there's all different types of anaerobic digestion. When you talk about composting, there's all different types of composting. So, and you know, Caroline was talking about this certified compostable packaging. That is going to be a separate conversation than if you're mixing it with yard waste and, you know, wood chips. And, you know, so it really gets pretty complicated to find the highest and best use every time. And so I think the danger, as Nora was mentioning, is kind of that like race to the bottom where it's just like, forget it, just put it all in the MSW stream and like press it out <laughs> and, you know, let's just stop trying to source separate. But, uh, you know, one of the slides in the opening keynote made me happy because there it was, like source separation, you know, wherever possible. And so, again, I think it's kind of end, you know, I think we should try to, you know, separate out what makes sense at different levels of, you know, manufacturing, distribution, retail, the consumer level, and maybe you also need that press at the end of the day to capture everything that, that you miss. So I'll stop there. Um, just to build on uh, all the excellent comments, um, the one thing I want to make sure is clear that there is actually a behavioral aspect to this, which is the assumption that, um, you know, we want to get the most 
material, and the best way to do that is to commingle everything. And in our area, we have the yard waste along with the food waste, and that in itself causes um, trouble because what happens is by commingling in your bin, it then has to be separated, and that's what we've been talking about. And it's so analogous to what we did with um, recycling. And we went from uh, the consumer separating, putting any of you who are old enough will remember we used to stack our newspapers and we'd have green bottles and we'd have brown bottles. Well, we now put everything in one place. So the amount of material once it gets to the recycling center is a lot less than if we were to separate it, but the idea is that we believe consumers will put more material in the bins if they can commingle it. And I think we're heading in the same direction with the organics, um, which is a little bit um, concerning. I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much for those really thoughtful uh, responses. You know, all of you, I think, started to touch upon some of the challenges that we're seeing in the space right now, whether it's um, behavioral changes, whether it's um, unintended downstream consequences, um, just the challenge of source separation in general. I'm wondering, what, what perhaps do you all see as the greatest investment opportunities for building and scaling these infrastructures throughout the US, whether it's composting, AD, or both? Um, would love to just open that up to whoever is, is willing and able to jump right in, in terms of opportunities for this space to address those key challenges. Yeah, I can go ahead and take the first go for it, ben. this. Thank um, you. I mean, I think it's definitely both. I mean, we were just talking about all the different streams, and you look at an area, it's, right now it's kind of, well, I have this pathway or this pathway. There's not enough infrastructure, not enough investment going into that. Um, to where you can say it's this and this. And that's what we gotta get to where if you look at a certain region, whether it be Washington, California, where there's these food waste mandates, that these mandates and policies are great, they're pushing us forward, you need the investment to follow to then have the solutions and outlets for the, the material to be able to go to divert it from landfill and then also start to hit these recovery goals that we're trying to set. So I think there's huge opportunity to kind of look at it more as a system and say, if we were, you know, if you're in Northern California or you're in, you know, King County, Washington, what do we need to do to support the residents, the restaurants, the farmers, the grocery stores, and how do we make that work and start to piece that together? And then what's that, you know, investment plan to make it happen? Uh, in our area, in, in the San Diego region, we have the ability to manage only 12% of all the food waste that we generate and that's through anaerobic digestion and uh, comp commercial composting. And so in addition, I'd add into the mix residential composting, self-management, on-farm composting, community composting, all of it is needed. And as a, a side note, we uh, eight years ago um, established a pilot program where we took food scrap from In-N-Out Burger and composted it at a farm that was less than a mile away and we resulted in five times more nutrient-rich compost than what they had been transporting in from 25 miles away. The, the In-N-Out Burger saved as much as $400 a month. I mean, it was just a win-win um, for everybody, but it was not permitted according to the ordinances in the county, and just this last September they passed, they updated the ordinance to allow that. So we've got so many different things going on here. We've got the investment, we've got policy, and I'll just, as a final note, in the state of California, you may know that we have a mandate now that requires that no organic material can go to the landfill. And that's been the kick in the seat of the pants for investment. I mean, that's how we even know that we have only 12% capacity to manage all the food waste that we generate because it's really caused us to put a spotlight on the problem. But my main point is to say that I think it's an, a mix. I don't think it's an or anaerobic digestion, commercial composting, and self-management, in, and prevention. I'll tell you a story later about uh, the importance of prevention. Yeah. I just want to add <clears throat> to the conversation about infrastructure. So I, th I think it was uh, one of these webinars or conversations where uh, we were looking at, you know, what's the data out there? What do we know about where this infrastructure is? How much it can take? What do they take? What are their, mar you know? And really, there's, when you look at the nation as a whole, we've got a lot of, and I'll just talk composting for a minute, food waste composting deserts. There's 
I think, I can't remember that we just finished uh, wrapping up a food waste composting facility survey, so I haven't seen the breakdown by states, but there's many regions of this country that are very underserved. So your first inclination is, well, let's go build infrastructure there. But the other investment that I think is really, really needed, and it, it hit home like in the plenary this morning, is where's the best point of intervention to start to get the behavior change going on. And there's not, and again, it depends on your sector, but um, it's really, it, how do you, either technology innovation, social science innovation and investments, but where you really can marry the whole sort of evolution in the food system, so you're getting prevention, you're getting, and then when it comes down to the recycling piece, how you optimize the quality of what you're separating so that it does go into a high value end product because at the end of the day, in order to make money in the sector, in the organics recycling sector, it's important to monetize the outputs. Yeah, and so speaking of outputs, you know, Nora is always great at reminding us, you know, what is the end goal? Is it to reduce carbon, which a lot of people is, that's why they're doing this. Is it to create a beautiful product that is useful, or is it strictly landfill diversion at a base level? And as long as it doesn't go in the landfill, anything else is fine. So I think that there is a lot of, you know, discussion to be had about what is the goal, and then therefore, what interventions are you looking for, and what investment is going to get you to that goal? Um, but you know, speaking of the transportation piece, I think that um, you know, Nora mentioned those gaps. If you look out, you know, at the country or the continent, you know, there's the gaps, and it's like, okay, can you just like put a facility there to you know plug that gap? Um, but also, you know, the regulations that Jessica mentioned, like that's where it's, you know, bankable and, you know, it's, it's like, okay, like if we build it, like they will come, not like a hopefully they will come kind of situation. And then, um, you know, just one more note about the transportation, you know, anaerobic digestion in general, I would say, has a benefit because... Um, you know, enclosing composting facilities, um, you know, if you're going to do it in vessel, that helps. Um, but it's very expensive. And so anaerobic digestion and composting facilities are both extremely hard to permit, um, you know, even in those places that need the infrastructure, you know, according to their own laws. Um, but, you know, certainly anaerobic digestion seems to have a little bit of advantage um, from like a, you know, a nimbyism or like a community viewpoint of perspective because, um, you know, I think big, large, open, you know, windrow composting facilities um, are much harder to site than anything that is enclosed and, um, or in vessel. In vessel. Yeah, and, and maybe I'll just double click on that for a moment, talking about sort of those regulatory challenges that both of these industries face. Can we maybe expand upon that and talk about, like, what does perhaps supportive policy look like in this space, or not even policy alone, but maybe the assistance of municipalities in order to address those gaps. We've talked about permitting, we've talked about other regulatory challenges, um, even just the inherent nature of what these systems are and this sort of nimbyism uh, uh, belief, you know? How, how can we start to break down those, those barriers and those preconceived notions through things like policy, perhaps, or other actions? And anyone can take that. I, <laughs> I can go first. Sure. Um, you know, I think the you brought up municipalities. I think you know that public-private partnership mm -hmm. that is a huge deal because just like you know businesses and residents out there getting cities on board um, is a whole challenge in and of itself. And they often are running wastewater treatment plants. So there's, you know, biosolids is a, you know, I think we're talking about food waste here, but again, you know, it's, it's in that mix. And so, you know, if you can get more municipalities, I think, um, you know, the, the keynote they mentioned, the, you know, the state is ultra, ultra important. Now we're seeing federal action, which is sort of a brand new thing. Um, but like, you know, we're never going to see that like standardized, like everywhere is the same solution kind of thing. Um, so I think that those are all important things to recognize. And 
you know, it's sort of the, you know, the chicken and the egg. You know, it's like, it's sort of painful to watch the regulations get passed when the infrastructure is not there, but it's not going to be there without the regulations. And so, you know, that kind of like figuring out what that um, ideal policy looks like. So I'm really excited to see that report that's coming out today. That's on. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so in a project BioCycle is doing with the composting consortium, um, we looked at all 50 states and their regulations for um, upgrading, retrofitting an existing yard trimmings composting site to be able to take food waste. And then we went through a cost, you know, to get the facility, uh, the permitting and the regs. And then at the end, we ranked them, we gave them a grade. And it's ironic, I, I live in Pennsylvania. Uh, we, one often says, well, tiered regulations for at least on the composting side, very much facilitate infrastructure development from community composting all the way up to centralized industrial composting. And so Pennsylvania has tiered regulations, but there is, it is next to near impossible. It takes forever. It takes a f many years for, to get a permit actually through that system because there's not a centralized office. It's all decentralized. New Jersey passed a, a commercial food waste disposal ban. And uh, there's a sad story of a, a woman who's been trying to site a composting facility and she has just been smack met with NIMBY local level, has to go through, so she's in a retreat. But the state permitting for any kind of, whether you're doing a food waste digester like Trenton Biogas or a composting facility is so onerous. So here you have a state that passes a policy but will not budge on changing their regs. So it, it is that it's gotta be core and then make the state the champion. I'll end by giving, I was just telling somebody, we gave or are giving New York State an A because they have been very responsive to the evolution of what infrastructure looks like under their solid waste regulation, which covers on-farm, covers community composting, covers anaerobic digestion. And then now they they're have guidance for transfer stations where they have drop off for food scraps and micro haulers that are, you know, collect, you know, so they're very responsive. So I think it's, it's, it's a process, but you will find champions in these states and, and NRDC is doing like model policy at the local level for municipalities, uh, zoning, uh, different things. So there's a lot of conversation and as, Dana said this morning with pilots, like enough of these have been piloted, like we just gotta, you know, just make a decision, go for it, support it. Yeah, we're kind of like at the precipice, I feel like, where, you know, if you're policy or regulators within the state, you may have may have no experience with this type of stuff, or you know bandwidth, or maybe you have poor experiences. I know there's been, you know, you look at some of the digesters that have been developed or and they, you know, come and go or something like that. So I think it's a dialogue, it's a evolution. I think it's gotta be communicative in terms of the solutions providers, the investors, the policy makers, and then the people that are actually enforcing that. Because, you know, I think California is a, a great example. It's, you know, of how you don't wait, it's a chicken or egg, but I think put it out there and then let's work on continuing to figure out how we can make this work and that requires a dialogue, whether it be hauling restrictions or, you know, where does it make sense to have these facilities? Um, what's working, what's not working? It needs to be, we have to be willing to kind of say that worked or that didn't work and then continue to tweak it. So I feel like we're having that now more so than ever, which is cool to see. And I have a quick comment on that. Um, we work heavily with uh, Cal Recycle because we are boots on the ground. We're going out and inspecting on behalf of different municipalities um, the businesses. So we're going to grocery stores and restaurants and helping them figure out where they're wasting food, how they can prevent it, where they can donate it, and how best to dispose of it. Um, and, so, and so we work heavily with Cal Recycle. They're taking our input. They're making tweaks. And, um, you know, it's... It, 
it's great, especially even with a big state, you would think this would be quite difficult, but absolutely the way to go is, is uh, put your foot across the start line and, and get going. Um, I had another comment. Um, I've forgotten, so maybe if it, come back If it me. comes back to you, cut me off. Okay. <laughs> um, one more question for the group before we open it up to a Q&A with the folks in the room. Uh, I think it's become clear over the last 30 minutes or so that yes, these are distinct downstream processing technologies and there's different um, benefits and drawbacks that come with both, but there are some shared challenges and sort of key commonalities that exist in space. We've also been talking a lot about how, or, or about the systems level of uh, approach to problem solving, which of course is um, incredibly important for all of the work that we've been talking about this, this week so far at the summit. And I'm wondering, you know, when thinking about this from a holistic point of view, uh, right now the, the composting consortium is, is in its early days of uh, developing this sort of investment thesis on how can AD and composting achieve this sort of like symbiotic future in the state of synergy? Is there a future in which they coexist? How do they work together? Would love to open that question back to you all. Um, you know, are we are we dreamers here? Is it even possible to really achieve the state of synergy? And if so, what does that path to symbiosis look like? We've already started to touch upon it in the last half hour, but maybe just an opportunity to expand upon that before we uh, open the floor. Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at, we talked about how do you get that level of source separation that is realistic for the, the start of the, you know, this process. And then, you know, I think about a, a transfer station, like a solid waste transfer station today, what comes in, how it gets sorted. There's, there's a world, I think, where there's some separation up front. You understand the market really well. You've implemented processes for people, maybe some technology to support them on that. And then you have a very distinct way of measuring and understanding what's coming from each of these areas. And then we have the outlets to say, OK, this is green waste, yard waste. This can go to compost. This is contaminated. We need to do some extra separation here. Um, and there, maybe there's some DPAC. Uh, and then you know, with anaerobic digestion, there's an, a digestate that needs to be composted on the back end as well. So I think there's ways that it's really you know, where they can live synergistically. Um, and there's areas where it's it's working in little in little pockets. I think that you know it'd be great to see if we could really. And this is where the public-private partnerships come in. Where if you have a municipality that's like, okay, let's really push this. The hauling aspect, you got to bring all these all these different parties together, which is the the challenging piece. But um, I think there's you know there's definitely a world where they they work together. I have a really ugly but informative, informative slide that I've used in my presentations for years. And so it's integrated infrastructure where you want to break down silos between the various departments in a city, for example, or state. And so in an ideal world where that symbiosis comes in is how many of those agencies can you pull in in support of a project? So. For many cities, stormwater management is an issue. Many, uh, the sewer lines can be clogged with fat soils and grease. So there's very established, long established fat soils grease collection. You put that, uh, take it to the wastewater, you know, get the, if your wastewater treatment plant has an anaerobic digester, get them on board with co-digestion, and you can divert the fat soils and grease there. Now, you take, uh, the digestate, you compost it, you can use that to improve your soils, to improve infiltration. And then when you're looking at the diverting of food waste, don't just look at it as a solid waste thing, it's a social and public health issue. So when you start to integrate that, you break down that silo. And so it's, I think the symbiosis makes the most sense when you can use, like every, what did they say with the pig, everything but the squeal? You know, like, and you've got to figure out who's got skin in, and get as many people who have skin in the game in the room. Uh, and I have a slightly different perspective about the symbiosis um, uh, issue, and that is the connection between anaerobic digestion and composting. Um, the obvious thing is to take the digestate, which is over 90% of the volume that goes in as feedstock, comes out as a solid. 
um, what happens with anaerobic digestion is that renewable, the minerals and nutrients are extracted to make renewable natural gas, but you still have a physical product that comes out the end. And what we've been uh, told by commercial composters is they do not want that digestate because it's mostly been denuded. Now we had an internal discussion um, before, and I think it was um, Ryan who was saying that you know he's heard that there's or understands that there's phosphorus and nitrates that are still coming out in the digestate that should be useful for the composters. Our experience is the commercial composters do not want it because it's not got as much minerals and nutrients as the virgin food scrap. And as I said, we only have the ability to manage 12% of all the food scrap in our area. So com commercial composters want the raw material, which we have a lot of. They'd rather not take it from the anaerobic digestion as their byproduct. So we have a big issue. The first place that the anaerobic digester in our area was going to go was to take it out of state because their regulations were less stringent. Now, would they land apply it, which you're not supposed to do directly with digestate? Would they put it in the landfill? It's not quite clear. But there was enough of an uproar that they're now trying to figure out what to do with it um, in the area. They're generating 100 tons a day of digestate and with not a uh, you know, place to send it. So I think it does, it can pencil out in certain areas. I think it's really a beautiful idea if you first extract the minerals and nutrients to make renewable natural gas, then you take that byproduct and you compost it. But it, the reality is it may not be that easy. Yeah, and I think you know, competition is you know a word that we talked about er in earlier today you know versus collaboration and there is competition for that financing and funding there is competition you know for better or for worse between you know donation and recycling or you know animal feed and anaerobic digestion and composting and so you know different stakeholders have different motivations and there is competition and you know w from what i've heard is no matter what you know digestate is something that anaerobic digesters have to deal with whether they dewater it and use it as bedding or um, you know they land apply it or you know it gets composted or dried um, they've got to do something with it and you know anecdotally what I've heard from composters is that there's a lot of odor it's again most AD systems that I've seen that handle food waste are wet AD systems so the material is very wet which you know, in Arizona, a composter might be like, oh, yeah, you know, bring it on. But um, in the Northeast or in Canada or something, they might be like, no, thank you. You know, so, um, you know, how to break down that competition in those silos, how to, you know, co-locate, as Ben mentioned, as many of these processes as possible so that that transportation is as little as possible because that's so much of the cost, that's so much of the emissions, um, and, you know, that's, that's a huge part of the challenge. Thank you so much. Uh, I think you've given our audience a lot to think about as we transition into this open Q&A for the next 15 to 20 minutes. But first and foremost, can I just get a quick round of applause for these amazing <laughs> panelists? Really. Um, yeah, I'd love to open the floor. Would anyone like to kick us off with a question, a burning question? And we'll bring a microphone over to you. Yes, in the back. Sorry, one moment. Microphone's going around. I did remember what I was going to say, which is the state legislation in California actually puts the onus on the jurisdictions, um, which is very interesting. So the jurisdictions, being cities and counties, are required to put in place ordinances to really facilitate this. And then the jurisdictions, beginning in 2024, can start fining the businesses. So it's an interesting, um, I just wanted to share that as we're talking about who's responsible. And I'm so sorry, Christy, but um, really quick, want to do a plug for the U.S. Composting Council's Target Organics Hub. Um, so basically, it's a resource tool for municipalities uh, to talk about how to upgrade their yard waste facility to a, a food waste composting facility um, from collection to permitting. Anyway, just Target Organics, sorry. <laughs> so Ryan may have answered my question for me, but that's okay. So uh, first off, thank you all so much for being here. It's amazing to be able to pick your brains because it's such a great way to educate everyone here and ourselves. So thank you for all that you do. 
Um, my question, like you were saying, is about regulation. So obviously there's a lot of restrictive re regulation because of back bad actors in the past. So I would love to create this resilient network of backyard to community to um, AD to commercial to on-farm composting. I mean, that is all so essential, all of those things together, right? So do you have any specific success stories that you could provide that regulation has been able to enable all of these resource, resources at the same time? And how could we potentially share that with our local regulators to replicate in our specific areas? And if you want clarity on that question, let me know. Thank you. Um, I'll point to Ohio, Angel Arroyo Rodriguez, um, you know, past, uh, I think it was 300 square feet, now it's up to 500 square feet. I think Maryland, uh, the governor just signed, I think it was 10,000 square feet. You know, so I think that, like, definitely promoting backyard and promoting those smaller scale facilities, you know, we really don't want to only rely on industrial, um, but, you know, as as far as, you know, the tiers go, um, yeah, um, I'll stop. Uh, I would just add in, um, you just mentioned Maryland as a case in point, you know, they have tiers, they instituted, a you know, their commercial disposal ban, but anecdotally what I have heard is if you're a commercial scale, the you can do is it ten thousand cubic yards a year is tier is a lower tier of regulation, but when you want to get go you're ready to grow and expand <clears throat> to go to that tier two level above that, it's really, really hard. You know, it's just it's not a walk in the park. And so I think, you know, again looking to New York State, one of the things that I was impressed with about them in looking at their regs is they listen and they learn. They made this one tier, let's say it was 2,500 tons a year of food waste with less regulation, or I think it was lower than that. Five years later, there's been no mal, oh, you know, no big, maybe a hiccup here or there, but confident that it can be handled with the right training and education, upped it. So I think, and similar, you know, with the 10, you guys had to really fight hard in Maryland for that, you know, and so it just shouldn't be that hard. And unfortunately, there are many states who have created sort of these, and not, what about Massachusetts? I think, you know, they, have a, they were one of the first to do on-farm composting, make, I can't remember how many tons a week or whatever. But there, in order to site a facility, you need the local boards of health permission to, to get it through. So that's, and as it should, right? It's in that community. You don't want to have the impact, but that makes it very, very challenging. So. Yeah, we, I guess for us, like a specific scenario where we saw, was both in Washington and California, but it is very much multi prong, like the, the local health or jurisdiction, making sure they understand what we're here to do, the credibility aspect. I think there's a big educational piece about it. And I think so when we go in working at the state level or the local level is really, you know, who we are, what is our intent and how do we and what have we done that's really focused on, you know, managing wasted food through digestion is a complex, it seems like a very simple system, but getting that right where you're just managing food waste through that and not co-digesting or doing it through a wastewater treatment where you have some buffer to it. And like, how do we make sure that we're showing the carbon intensity and that we've mapped this out? I think there's the educational and like full story piece that really resonates. And we saw, you know, both with CEQA and SEPA in those two states, which can be a long process. Um, we're successful in both of those, but it varies very much so based on, they have, they have mandates, so they're motivated to do that. Other states maybe that don't, it's okay, what is this potential thing that's coming in and how do we, how do we uh, regulate this? And because it's so new, is this a transfer station? Is this a uh, landfill? Um, so I think we still have some work to do at the policy level and an education standpoint and the, the local government level. So just really want to quickly add in, um, many states in looking at their regs do require operator training. So like the USC or the uh, compost, the foundations, 
compost operator training uh, course. But I thought that was really impressive because that is, it's not just the operator, well, they definitely need to be trained, but the regulators. And then the last comment just on regulating standalone food waste facilities is very few states have in their solid waste regs specific regs for, there's some that are now developing them, but a lot of times it defaults over to the wastewater yeah. side. Hi, I'm Leo Pollock from the compost plant. Um, so we're based in Rhode Island. Um, we're actually, ironically, not a composter anymore. Um, we're just an organic waste hauler. Um, so we move material to digesters and compost facilities. Um, one of the interesting things we've seen in Rhode Island, it's happening in Massachusetts um, in particular, is it feels like we're seeing a lot of money now pouring into AD infrastructure. Um, you know, I know of $2 billion invested between Vanguard Renewables and Divert, um, you know, within the last 12 months. Um, so I, I guess my first question is sort of, are we, are we seeing sort of um, interest in renewable natural gas, um, you know, and that infrastructure kind of tail wagging the dog in terms of what infrastructure we're likely to see in the future? I don't hear or see or have experienced any similar types of investment or commitment to composting. Um, and so I guess my first question is, does that, is that your experience? Is that sort of what you're seeing in the organics industry? And the second is kind of what is the role of haulers in this as the connection point between, you know, food waste generators, whether it's at a supermarket or at a restaurant, and then getting that material in the format and to the specs that digesters or compost facilities require, um, that's something we're really focused on now is thinking about could we do some kind of pre-processing. A lot of times I know that gets cited at digesters, but to think more, we're working with a Danish company where that's fairly common to have some kind of pre-processing to then be the intermediary step between the generator and, you know, in this case, digesters that are looking for slurried food waste in high volumes cons on a consistent basis. So I, I know that's right up your alley, but I just want to jump in with a fast answer to the investment in RNG and having been covering you know th this for many years, many of the players are coming out of the energy sector, the oil and gas sector, and they're specifically looking at low carbon fuels and there's incentives that drive it. And the slippery slope there for somebody who's about organics recycling is that the digestate in many of those instances is a liability, like it's a cost that they, and so they're really going for that. And my fear is over time, if whatever might happen, we all go to our EVs, what does that do, right? So that's, is that really solid infrastructure? Um, I just quickly, because I learned recently about what you do, I think it's interesting because most of the pre-processing at transfer stations or like Vanguard standalone is all very heavy DPAC. And to do some kind of separation that is a little more thoughtful about capturing the organics and separating is maybe not as efficient, but it opens up opportunities to go to composting and AD. Yeah, I mean, this is the question that we definitely get a lot, you know, especially with the recent investment. And you look at the, you know, is it the tail wagging the dog with the energy industry? And I think we have to be disciplined enough to really be able to say, okay, how is this looking at from a carbon perspective? that we're introducing a solution that's carbon negative and we're actually doing it for the right reasons. And that the investment, I mean, at the end of the day, right, how do we make this, when we talk about sustainability, the, from the financial perspective, when an investor is looking for that return or like how do we make this a business, I think that's a little bit, it's been harder on the compost side. And so when we look at that digestion, you have that energy that's kind of, moving that forward, when we look at our facilities that 
it's really how do we provide this for the upstream and look at you know how are we relaying back and doing prevention this is setting up that foundation where we can start that work because that's a multi-year process and you know we have to put a lot of things in place but then when the you know if electricity electrification hydrogen whatever it may be if RINs and those things take off we have the ability to address that infrastructure to support those different markets so we're not bound by just RNG. That's right now the way that we're able to continue to move forward on this infrastructure development, and it supports all the upstream stuff. But we're looking at it systemically, and that's why I think we have to make sure we are doing that and not just tunnel vision on, hey, this is what's going to make us money, and this is how we're going to move forward. Um, so I think we just have to stay disciplined in that. But I think, you know, if we, when we look at that modular kind of RNG compression back end, that's kind of how we're thinking about that. If electrification makes sense in certain markets and there's incentives to be able to build and support the region, we're able to do that as well. And the big investment money is going more toward anaerobic digestion. And I talked to um, Generate Capital a couple years ago, and they were only investing in anaerobic digestion. I think that's changed, and they just made a big investment in, I think, Oasis yeah, uh, Atlas, Atlas, Atlas uh, $200 million. But the money really is going to what appears to be a cleaner solution, cleaner appears in from the, the outside investor. Um, the... Um, one thing I would say, and back to the question that you had, Christy, um, was that we need all these solutions. I'm a big proponent of self-management, um, and meaning managing at the location where it's generated, whether it's on-farm, whether it's residential, whether it's in, within a community. And um, what I have seen is that it builds awareness of how much waste you're generating. Our community composting program that we have on site the individuals generate 50%, less than 50% of all the food waste um, per capita that the average American generates. And I believe that that's through the awareness that's built in when you see it. When we first started doing this type of work, we would go into grocery stores and they would have a compactor. They'd be putting the food in along with plastics and other things, that types of plastics that couldn't be recycled. They had no idea of how much um, food waste they were generating. And now, as we're having them put it aside for donation or for disposal, they're saying, oh my goodness, look how much Brussels sprouts we're throwing away. Why, you know, why is that? And they're really um, being much more intentional. So I think that's a very big piece of it. Yeah, and Leo, I'd like to address the hauler piece. Um, you know, we, um, you know, work with about 700 haulers, organics recycling haulers across the U.S., and about 22% of them are vertically integrated. So, you know, that's 80% of folks that are basically, you know, at the whim of whatever facility they're going to, um, which is, you know, a somewhat dangerous place to be. Um, so, you know, Y'all are on the front line um, of the education piece of educating the consumers and giving the feedback um, to those um, generators on contamination, on, you know, you're not using the program, you could be doing something better with your Brussels sprouts, whatever that, you know, education piece is, is absolutely huge. But, you know, without the haulers, then those facilities don't, you know, get that material. Um, so it's just extremely important. And, you know, one exciting thing is that people are doing it in a million different ways. And we see this uh, trajectory. Um, I guess the Sustainable Packaging Coalition, and shout out to Olga Kachuk, you know, she actually mapped out this, like, arc of, you know, folks with five-gallon buckets doing residential to 64-gallon carts. Next thing, you're, they're doing whole municipalities, and that's just, like, really awesome to see. Um, but, you know, we absolutely need the haulers and, like, again, front line of the education piece, of the feedback, and... You know, to your point, Leo, like the, it has to be the type of material that those facilities are going to accept. Um, so I definitely think that, you know, pre-processing is just smart from, you know, just, a, you know, protecting your business perspective. And I might just add one more thing um, from the closed loop partners perspective. We're, you know, as more investment is pouring into the space, and Jessica, you touched upon it briefly, mentioning that I think some people have this idea that AD is like the cleaner solution, quote unquote. So we're trying to think about this as investment interest continues to grow, 
we really need to start the, to move the needle on contamination and ways to both mitigate contamination but also measure it. So one of the projects that we're undertaking uh, on the composting consortium's behalf or on our side is that we're working with 10 composters throughout the United States right now uh, running a contamination pilot to assess what are the uh, interventions upstream that are best suited to reduce contamination, how is that playing out in real time, and um, how can that be feasibly scaled throughout the composting industry. So just, just wanted to add that plug, forgive me, but it is something we're evaluating because we want to take that data and use it to inform part of our investment roadmap to, to really drive uh, investment into this space with specific metrics around contamination. So I think that's, that answers your question in part as well. Um, we have five minutes left, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say we have time for one more question, but we'll, we'll do our best to keep it brief. Thank you. So there's been a lot of different things thrown out here, the community composting, the home composting, the investment. One piece that I've been um, thinking about and collecting data on is the equity piece in that a lot of, there's, there's data that is showing that <coughs> communities that have the infrastructure of the large composting facilities also might not have access to composting at the same time or organics recovery. And so I think putting those data pieces all together, and you, you just mentioned the awesome data piece of the contamination, like putting this whole thing together and saying that when we want to direct investment to um, uh, solve this problem, I think that the understanding of which communities have been historically burdened, which communities are still being historically burdened or still being burdened by, by infrastructure, while simultaneously not getting access to use of that infrastructure, um, how can we use that piece to understand a better model of investment? Because what's if we're, we're investing in AD, okay, but what about the community composting? What about the home composting investment that is often ignored but is a big solution to this overburdened, underserved areas? So I just wanted to put that out there as a is a piece that this whole thing is, is thinking about. And if the panel has any opinions on that matter, I'd love to hear it. So thank you. Um, I just want to give a shout out to Marvin Hayes in the corner in the city of Baltimore and Kenny back there uh, doing exactly that kind of investment in the community, the training of the youth, the engagement. Are you speaking tomorrow? Encourage you to go here. I was just going to mention the Green Era project um, in South Chicago. I don't know if you guys are all familiar, um, but um, another kind of example that ties uh, together a lot of what we're talking about. So big investment, it's AD, it's composting, it's also bringing the community in. They're going to be growing food right there in a place where access to fresh local food isn't you know, um, the easiest. And so it's just a, an example that ties together a lot of these pieces. So um, more examples like that where it's an integrated facility and it's like it's education it's access and it's like the whole food cycle um, you know like it's not just it's not just creating great soil and then shipping it out of state it's like creating great soil and using it right there for the people that are affected by the truck traffic or whatever yeah I think one of the like we're talking a lot about the back end infrastructure here, whether it be at whatever scale, like local, small, commercial, whatever level of the investment is. But I think you know we as we all know, like food waste and food insecurity are directly correlated to each other. And so how do we start making sure that there commu that, that there's some communication pathways and some actual physical pathways to be able to make sure that, okay, let's learn from this unsold food, from this wasted food. Let's have the, those facilities and that infrastructure in urban environments and communities where it's maybe a little bit hard to permit those whatever type of facility it is. So there's a lot of different pieces to that. I think you know, we're, we really are looking for, albeit at the larger commercial scale, I think it can translate down to whatever level is, how can we locate these in more... Uh, where the food is being uh, grown and then where it's also being, you know, feeding people and how can we drive more of that towards the food banks to the people that need to and learn from that and you keep it as close as possible because this is fresh food at the end of the day, which is really hard to manage logistically. And so we need to be able to be a permit and get these types of things and the investment and the education going as close to the people that are eating the food 
And so I think that's where we got to kind of continue to focus more and more. Right now, it's a lot of, you know, agricultural or, or, you know, in rural environments where it's not really, we're not bringing that back. And we're not, it's just kind of that, that out of sight, out of mind environment. And to your point about Green Era, like, that's where we're, you know, seeing more of, of how do we integrate these things and, and really make sure people know that this is, this is an option and that this is a solution. And in addition to not losing sight of the social aspect, I want us not to forget that there's an environmental aspect, and that's that's where we're coming at it um, at Solana Center for Environmental Innovation. And just as a, a, a sidebar, anaerobic digestion only reduces the greenhouse gas emissions by a third as compared to composting, and that includes the land application. So there's so many aspects tied up in this. Basically, I'd love to get to the point where we're not thinking about it as a problem because it's waste. We're thinking about a problem because it's creating environmental issues. We've got social issues tied up in it as well. Um, so my final word. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, that, yes, please. Thank you for your applause.